Hello, I'm Chris Valkynen. We're at Steam Museum here in Swindon, and today we're looking at City of Troy. City of Troy was built in 1903 just a year after George Jackson Churchward had taken over as chief mechanical engineer of the Great Western Railway. So the Great Western Railway had finished the decade before converting its track from the broad gauge to the standard gauge, reducing the width of its track from seven foot to four foot eight and a half. The broad gauge had been Brunel's idea for a fast and smooth railway, relying on the wide width of the tracks to have a low center of gravity. However, it introduced lots of problems for the railway going forward because every time a train needed to go from the broad gauge to a standard gauge, everything on the train had to be offloaded onto a different train that could travel on the different tracks. For a long period of time, the GWR had used mixed gauge track to allow it to run both types of trains, but this wasn't practical on a long-term basis and thus had ripped up all of the broad gauge just to leave the standard gauge behind. With all of that done, the GWR could now focus on other tasks, in particular improving the quality of its rolling stock and its locomotives. When George Jackson Churchward had taken over as the CME of the GWR in 1902, straight away Churchward started introducing new experimental locomotives. That included locomotives that he took as a trial from France that were compound locomotives, as well as his two experimental St. class locomotives. However, another one of those experiments that Churchwood tried was with the City class. Here, he took one of the 440 Atborough classes called Mauritius and trialled a brand new boiler, the first tapered boiler design on the GWR. Those experiments led to a really interesting locomotive in the City class, which is a mix of 19th century design and up-to-date 20th century design. So these 20th century modifications made for a much more powerful engine and that may have allowed it to achieve a special record. The context for the record run is rooted in the competition between transatlantic shipping lines at the start of the 20th century. The London and South Western Railway had expanded its port in Southampton to compete with Liverpool and attract liners stopping off on their way. However, while Southampton's facilities were far superior, Plymouth was much closer to North America, and since any train could easily outpace the fastest ship, passengers and mail bound for London that disembarked in Plymouth could save six hours from their journey. On the 9th of May 1904, the German liner Kronprinz Wilhelm docked in Plymouth. The GWR's Ocean Mails Express departed Plymouth carrying the mail from the ship bound for London. On board was journalist and rail enthusiast Charles Rouse Martin. As the train left Plymouth, it was headed by City of Truro with five mail coaches. The journey was exceptionally fast, with signallers instructed to keep the track clear ahead of the train. With his two stopwatches recording the times as the train passed the mileposts every quarter of a mile, Rouse Martin recorded the train achieving an exceptional average speed of 70 and a quarter miles per hour between Exeter and Bristol, which he excitedly reported in his article in the Times newspaper the next day. So what Rouse Martin didn't mention was that for a brief quarter mile section, he'd recorded this locomotive achieving 102 miles per hour. That he wrote in a letter to the Great Western Railway's general manager, asking for permission to publish that record. The company was concerned that making it public would spark fears around railway safety and in the letter Rouse Martin tries to persuade the GWR that because the train didn't carry passengers it would not cause a problem. The existence of Rouse Martin's record was not publicly acknowledged by the GWR until 1922, 14 years after Rouse Martin's death. However, there has forever been much debate over the accuracy of the record. Flying Scotsman's 100 mile an hour record in 1934 was verified by a dynamometer car which could accurately record the speed of the train in real time. Rouse Martin relied upon stopwatches to time the distance between quarter mile posts, which at the speed the train was travelling at came at every 8.8 .8 seconds. 
Accounting for variability in human reaction times and the accuracy of the watches, the margin of error was more than two miles per hour, and quite simply, there was no way to independently verify the speeds that Rouse Martin claimed. As important that record may sound of 100 miles an hour, just the year before in 1903, in Germany, engineers had achieved a speed record of 130 miles an hour with an electric rail car. So that speed record of 100 miles an hour would only apply to steam locomotives anyway. So here we are at the front of the locomotive. We've got some interesting details to take note of at the front here. So first off, we've got the two lamps. The two lamps on the buffer beam here tell us that this is an express passenger locomotive. we we'll also point out down here the number 3717. That's the second number that was carried by City of Truro. When it was first introduced, it was 3440. However, when the GWR really numbered its locomotives, it became 3717 as a member of the city class, which were the 3700s. We'll also take a quick look down here. So this locomotive is a two-cylinder inside cylinder locomotive. Unlike more modern locomotives like Lodestar, which had four cylinders, this just had two in, in between the frames, which meant that it couldn't quite get the power that you would out of a four-cylinder locomotive, but it was a lot simpler. The locomotive is a 440, so if we take a look down here, we can just make out the front bogey. So it's got four wheels at the front, which carry the, uh, the front end of the locomotive. We've also got a wonderfully polished single chimney at the top there. And we, here we have City of Truro's nameplate, a really beautifully polished brass nameplate in the traditional Great Western style. Also notice around it and across the locomotive, the brilliant lining, lining out of the engine in its classic livery. So here, along the side of the locomotive, we can also spot one of the defining features that makes this stand out as a Victorian engine. Here we can see the double frames of the locomotive. Double frames mean that there are essentially two sets of frames going on both outside of the wheels and inside of the wheels. So here, outside the wheels, we can see the wheels are largely covered of the frames outside it, but also here, here we can see the inside section of the frames at the far side of the running board. So one of the changes that Churchwood did, did introduce on his later locomotives was a set of single inside frames, which had the advantage of being much lighter in terms of weight because you're not carrying essentially two sets of frames. And the advances in materials that had taken place since the 19th century allowed him to do that. So one of the reasons it's nice to be able to do this from an ele elevated platform is we can really get a good look inside what's going on in between the frames. So if we look down in here, we can see the slide bars from the, for the inside cylinders carrying the connecting rods, which we might just be able to pick out are connected to the crank axles down there. Taking another look outside again, we've got the two sandboxes here on either side of the nameplate, which are controlled by this rod from the footplate. The sand could be dumped onto the track in front of the wheels to increase the adhesion to stop the locomotive from slipping. And here's a really good place to take a look at the boiler. So the boiler here is what really sets out this engine from um, the Atbara class. The Atbara class had a fairly standard Swindon parallel boiler Whereas here on the city class, and just like on Lodestar as well, we have this tapered boiler. So at the very front of the boiler, we've got this nice parallel section, but here, right in the middle of the boiler, we have the tapered section. And a tapered section does a few things. Firstly, it means that much more of the water in the boiler is closer to the firebox where most of the heating is happening, so it makes it more efficient. The other advantage is that when the locomotive is going downhill and the lever of the water wants to move towards the front of the boiler, less water can move down to the other end of the boiler, and that means that you keep more water above the firebox, reducing the chances that the top of the firebox becomes exposed and starts to soften. Another feature of the boiler is that we don't have a dome on the boiler. The regulator is inside the boiler, but there's no dome to collect the steam. What we do have 
here is the safety valve cover and also this pipe going up the side of the boiler here, the water into the boiler is fed in at the top, which improved the water circulation within the boiler. So one of the other features that we do get here of the wheels, we can't see the wheels terribly well, but we, the one thing that can't go in between the frames is the coupling rod. So there we've got the nice big long coupling rod between the two driving wheels of the locomotive. Here again, we have the number 3717 appearing very prominently on the side of the cab and it's beautiful polished. GWR number plate. Another feature, if we can look right up at the top there, we can hopefully just make out the two whistles that the locomotive carries. GWR engines had two whistles. The whistles were used for whistle codes, which could be used to communicate with signalers, or if there was a double heading of the locomotive, those whistle codes could communicate between the two engines as well. Another feature to pick out here is that blue A just there. That is the engine's route availability. A blue A was reasonably unrestrictive route um, availability, so the engine could go to a reasonable number of different places. We'll be coming back to this in a future video. So moving down towards the tender next. First off, we can see the classic livery, Great Western livery here and the beautiful lining out of the tender. Moving right down towards the end of the tender here, we've got We've got a couple of interesting features here. Firstly, the tank filler, so that big lid there lifts off. So you can put the bag in to fill up the, uh, fill up the tender or your hose if that's what you're working from. And then here we have this interesting dome feature. This is for the scoop for the water troughs. So the scoop would lower down into the trough whilst the locomotive was running, pick up the water, which would be forced up a pipe, and then uh, um, uh, the pipe opens up underneath that dome there and the water blasts out into the inside of the tank of the tender. So that's enough of the outside, let's go take a look in the cab. So we're up here now in the cab of City of Truro. Um, by the way, there might be a little bit of noise as the museum is starting to open up now. Anyway, we're going to continue with the tender uh, to pick out a few details here. So first off, handbrake, very important. Whenever you're stepping onto a locomotive, you check the handbrake is applied first. And we've got a few other little details going on up here, including this interesting hook shape thing, which is carrying the irons that would be slotted along the side of the tender there. Got some toolboxes. Another feature we have is this handle here. This is the handle which actually lowers and raises the water scoop into the trough. And these two little handles here are the water valves for our injectors. So they're mounted on the tender itself. So moving to the controls of the locomotive, this being a great Western engine, it's a right-hand drive engine, so driver on the right there, fireman on the left. Zooming out a little bit, we can see um, up here this painted on the side of the engine. We've got the vehicle's tops number here, so that's a modern addition. All preservation steam locomotives that run on the main line are class 98 locomotives in the top system. And we've also got the original number for the locomotive 3440, limited only to 60 miles an hour on the main line and 35 if going backwards with the tender. So more of the, the gauges here for the locomotive. We have just one water gauge, as again classic on all Great Western steam locomotives. Something that the farmers are paying very close attention to up here at the top is the steam pressure gauge and also the firemen on Passenger locomotives responsible for the steam heating of the train. So here we have the controls up here for the steam heat and the gauge there with details of what the pressure needed to be depending upon the number of carriages in the train. So up here we have the injector steam valves. So when putting on the injectors, you'd put on the water first, those valves at the back that we saw on the tender. Um, you turn those on first and then you turn on the steam valves. Um, and the next task was then trimming the water valves back on the tender until the um, injectors would pick up. Also down the bottom here, we have the all important firebox, the business end for the firemen. Not gonna see very much in there, it's quite dark, but Swindon engines had a long, narrow firebox, so made firemen's e job easier in terms of getting into the back corners, but they also needed to heft that coal quite a long way down that firebox. We also have two different fire hole doors on the engine. So we've got the big lever on the left with the big doors that slide across, but that was quite hefty to be moving. When you're firing the engine, you want to keep the secondary air to a minimum. You only need a little bit to keep the smoke clear. And any, if you have too much going in there, it can really damage the um, back of the boiler with the 
changes in temperature. So you try and keep the door as closed, closed as often as you could. And for that purpose, on the chain there, you have the flap that could be quickly and easily lifted up and down when you're firing the engine. Another feature that we have here, this is the control for the exhaust steam injector. So a locomotive having two types of injector, a live steam injector, which worked off of steam straight from the boiler, but the exhaust steam injector could take the exhaust steam after it had been used in the cylinders to power the injectors, which was a much more efficient use of steam. That steam otherwise just be going straight up the chimney. Down the bottom here, we have the levers for the dampers. The dampers control the air going into the firebox from underneath. So now we're taking a closer look at the driver's side of the engine. We've got a few, quite a few details going on here. We're going to start right at the top here. So we've got the two chains here, control the two different whistles. So you'd pull down on those chains to sound the whistle. Also at the top, another feature, this squiggly little pipe here leads all the way down to this. This is the hydrostatic lubricator. So those pipes at the top were condensing steam from the boiler which then forced the oil from the hydrostatic lubricator to the cylinders. So the important part for a driver, making it go and making it stop. First off, the regulator right in the middle with the long silver handle and right next to it, um, conveniently located for the driver to make their life easier, we've got the vacuum brake right next to it, so quite easy to swap between the two. The vacuum brake, all those holes there allow it when the brake is applied, allowing air into the pipe that destroys the vacuum. Here we also have the vacuum pressure gauge for the driver. Important so that they can see how the brakes are performing on the locomotive and the train. Another important feature here for the driver is our reverser. This is a screw reverser. It can be wound forwards and backwards to control which direction the locomotive is going to go, as well as introducing more cutoff to make the locomotive more efficient when it's running at speed. Also, we have down here the cylinder cocks which will be opened up when the locomotive is starting, especially when in cold weather, because it's releasing condensed water from the cylinders, which cannot compress and therefore could explode the cylinders if it doesn't have a method to get out. Another little valve here, we've got the blower. So the blower here, all that is used by the driver when approaching bridges and tunnels, essentially ensures that there's enough steam going through the smoke box to create a draft when there could be some air force down the chimney because that could cause a blowback into the cab, forcing all the incredibly hot fire into the cab and causing serious injuries. So that blow a very important safety feature on the locomotive. And another feature just down here, this lever is the sander. So we talked about the sanders outside. This is the lever for controlling them, moving it forward to release sand ahead or backwards if you're going in reverse and need the sand on the other side of the wheels going backwards. City of Truro is a locomotive that I have a lot of personal nostalgia for. It was one of the locomotives that I learned as a trainee fireman on. City of Truro was last steamed for the 100th anniversary of its speed record, which was in 2004, and its 10-year boiler ticket ended just, just after I started as a trainee, so I had a couple of days firing this locomotive, and I've got a lot of, lot of nostalgia for that. So there we have City of Truro, an interesting mix of designs from two different designers across two different centuries, but also a locomotive with a really interesting story about a maybe somewhat dubious record. What do you think of that record? Put your opinions in the comments below. However, regardless of what you think about the, that record, it was so important for the preservation of this locomotive and the reason why it's now in our collection. Thank you so much to Steam Museum for hosting us today. They've been absolutely wonderful. If you want to see more great Western steam locomotives, do get yourself to Swindon and take a look here. It is absolutely wonderful. And don't forget to like and subscribe.